Sergio Pereira. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much for well this kind uh, introduction. It's always very pleasant, you know, to have someone who, uh, let's say, has gone through, you know, the, the whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, the whole itinerary <laughs> of the speak. I would say so. Very, thank you so much. Um, the title of my uh, presentation is uh, "Through the Looking Glass of the EU's." readmission system. So as Professor Pereira told you, uh, this is um, actually a, a presentation which will focus on readmission. I will explain to you, to you what it is precisely, but it is also based on data which I collected uh, over the last 15 years or so. Uh, so it's a long-standing research. And um, well, going through the EU's readmission system, um, First of all, uh, readmission is, um, a, is an administrative process uh, through which a person, a foreigner, is um, um, deported, is expelled from the territory of uh, an immigration country because that person has no right or no longer the right to stay on the territory of that uh, country. So a person can be deported because uh, he or she is an irregular migrant or even a rejected asylum seeker uh, having no right or no longer any right to stay on the, ter on the territory of a given uh, country. Um, readmission is not a new topic, but what I believe is quite new is the way in which states are today practicing or cooperating on readmission. And I will explain, I will illustrate, you know, this new trend with uh, data. Um, so before introducing my analytical framework, um, I would like to say that my short presentation actually sets out to show uh, that beyond the recurrent reference to securitization, Coercion represents just one aspect of the whole architecture which sustains and consolidates at the same time the expansion of the EU's readmission system. I will give you a clear illustration of all that. I will show that this system has a regulatory and legitimizing function having implications for foreigners and, as I, and also uh, citizens. Actually, readmission is not simply a means of removing unwanted foreigners through coercive method, methods. When viewed as a means of ensuring the temporary stay of foreign workers in European destination countries' labor markets, readmission may also impact on the participatory rights of a growing cohort of native workers facing equally temporary, if not precarious, labor conditions in a context marked by employment deregulation and wage flexibility. So let me open the presentation which I prepared for you. Uh, I will explain very quickly uh, the structure um, of my presentation. This is it. So this is a lecture which is structured uh, as follows. First of all, I will explain to you, I will show to you the state of play. In other words, what do we know? What are the data related to uh, readmission, to the cooperation on readmission? Um, and then I will focus on lessons learned. What do we know when it comes to cooperating on readmission? What have the states, and especially the EU member states, learned when it comes to cooperating on readmission? Then I will focus very briefly on a paradox, which is illustrative of readmission. Namely, there's a periphery centrality paradox. What it is, very briefly, uh, readmission is a central topic in official rhetoric. Everybody is talking about readmission at, at the EU level, at a national level, uh, but at the same time, in practice, at de facto, this is a peripheral issue 
compared with all the critical issues which I'm going to present to you later. Then I will focus on the three functions of the EU's readmission system, which is coercive, regulatory, but also legitimizing. And then I will come to my conclusions, explaining the implications stemming from, the, uh, from these uh, uh, three functions, coercive, uh, coercion, regulation, and the legitimizing uh, function. Let's have a look at the state of play. Well, when it comes to the EU's readmission system, well, this is a highly inclusive system, which is in full uh, expansion. This is also a system where patterns of in interdependence are extremely varied. Uh, there are strong patterns of interdependence, but there are also weak patterns of inter of interdependence anyway. And well, when I say that it, is, that it is a highly inclusive system, well, I'm just trying to explain to you that by uh, talking about highly diverse patterns of interdependence, well, the state, the state is the key central actor. So yes, we can have heightened patterns of interdependence, but these do not mean that there is less state centrality. And there's the resilience, I would say, of the issue of sovereignty. And God knows that we all heard about, you know, the need to protect our national sovereignty when it comes to irregular migration. And readmission is here to protect, you know, the integrity of our national asylum system, etc. Well, all that is absolutely coherent with the system, which is in full expansion. And at the very least, such reinforced patterns of interdependence have affected states' ability to achieve goals and to defend their own interests. So I'm going to show to you some data which are illustrative of the expansion for now eh, of the EU's readmission system. Uh, before showing to you these uh, graphs, uh, these maps, actually, uh, let me explain to you how to read them. The darker the blue color and the more uh, involved in the EU's readmission system a country is. So uh, this is the situation in 2000, more than 20 years ago. Everything logically started from the EU, clearly, but still you can see here, you know, some countries which in North Africa, as of 2000, you know, were already involved, you know, at a bilateral level in this EU's readmission system in full expansion. Let's have a look at 2005. This is just after the European neighborhood policy, but also, you know, the, um, well, the, the concrete implementation of a Treaty of Amsterdam, which let's say promoted a cooperation on readmission, not only at a bilateral level, but also at a supranational level. I will talk about it later. 2010, you can see a gradual expansion of the system, you know, towards Asia, towards Africa, 2015 and today. So what do we observe with this map? We observe that some countries are definitely involved, you know, in, these, uh, in this uh, system. Some non-EU countries, especially where well, we see Russia, which is the major a player in the EU's readmission system. This is something that has to be highlighted, but also the Balkan countries here. And you can see that North African countries here, this is quite interesting, constitute like a kind of buffer zone. They are very much involved at a bilateral level with the EU's member states, especially with Italy, Spain, and France actually, but also Portugal, uh, but very slightly. Portugal has a very, le has a very small number uh, of uh, bilateral readmission agreements. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, four bilateral readmission agreements with non-EU countries, huh? uh, okay? And what you observe here, the United States, you know, is totally white. Why? Just because 
This does not mean that the United States does not cooperate on readmission with the EU's, uh, with the EU countries, not at all. There's a strong cooperation on readmission, but there's no need for a bilateral agreement, just because there's a kind of harmony, uh, a kind of common vision uh, uh, as applied to the cooperation, to cooperation on readmission. In other words, there's a, I would say, a regular and effective uh, cooperation between the United States and the EU member states. And if you look at the Eurostat data, you will see a lot of uh, US citizens, you know, who on a yearly basis are deported from Europe, just like if you look at the uh, um, Amer uh, North American statistics, you know, uh, of the ICE, actually, the ICE, the ICE, uh, you will observe that there are also many um, European nationals who are deported from the uh, United States. But again, as you can see here, this is not an anomaly, it's just that there's no need for a, 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 a bilateral agreement. There's cooperation, there's already harmony. Other, uh, other observations. Well, to date, we have more than 330 bilateral agreements linked to readmission uh, that have been stipulated between the 27 member states with non-EU countries worldwide. And these include, this is important, standard readmission agreements, in other words, agreements which exclusively and specifically deal with readmission, okay, but also non-standard readmission agreements, namely uh, agreements which are much more, let's say, flexible, uh, which do not necessarily deal exclusively with uh, readmission, but with many issue areas, and they are uh, stipulated with memorandum of understanding, exchanges of letter, administrative agreements, not, not verbal, and policy cooperation agreements, which include a clause on readmission. So these are, let's say, for the data, but let's go ahead. When it comes to the 27 member states, bilateral agreements linked to readmission, be they standard or non-standard, okay? We see, and these are the, let's say, the most recent data that we have, we see that, well, uh, the geographical distribution is quite interesting, but also the number for each EU member state. And what do we observe? We observe actually that not all the EU member states are equally engaged in cooperation on readmission. And uh, this is extremely important when it comes, for example, to the new pact on migration and asylum, which puts at the center of policy attention, uh, the need to reinforce cooperation on readmission and also the need to, uh, let's say, foster uh, solidarity across the member states. Well, we see um, that actually these, um, um, there, that there are discrepancies, you know, across uh, the countries. And this is quite interesting to observe anyway. Just an observation, not all the EU member states are equally involved, but also what we observe, for example, 70% uh, of the um, um, readmission agreements concluded with African countries are stipulated uh, by three EU member states, France, Italy, and Spain. Actually, you see Africa, we have uh, 41 um, agreements, okay, uh, as a whole, of course, and 70% of these 41 agreements are from France, Italy, and Spain. So again, this is, you have a lot of discrepancies across the member states. This is, this is also the regional distribution of the bilateral agreements, you know, of course, the Balkan countries are the most involved in this EU readmission system, just because um, readmission is part of the Schengen acquis, and these countries are looking for some of them, for most of them, they are looking forward to exceed the EU bloc, and of course, cooperation on readmission is a key benchmark, which has to be 
um, met by these uh, countries. So that's why actually uh, there's no surprise in uh, realizing that actually, uh, well, um, a, a, the, the, a large share of the uh, uh, bilateral agreements which are concluded by the 27 EU member states with third countries actually are, is, sorry, with the uh, Balkan countries. But well, uh, that's also interesting to, to note. This is a very uh, fascinating uh, map, which makes a distinction, you know, in terms of, I would say, practice, in terms of, um, yes, in terms of practice, in terms of how each EU member state cooperates on readmission. We made, as you know, a distinction between standard readmission agreements, but also non-standard readmission agreements. So uh, in other words, you have formal readmission agreements, but also informal readmission agreements. Informality is absolutely part and parcel of the expansion of the EU's readmission system. And you can see actually that some countries use I mean, are quite reliant, you know, on uh, the use of informal patterns of cooperation on uh, readmission. Uh, this is the case of Italy, of France, of Spain, of Greece, but also of Finland. It's a small number of um, of um, of agreements for Finland, but you can see. But anyway, the cooperation of Finland is very much based on informal arrangements on readmission. But actually, well, you can also see Germany, Denmark. So it's not a question of being, let's say, you know, Mediterranean or whatever. It's a pervasive practice across the, uh, uh, the EU uh, member states uh, anyway. So yes, practices differ markedly across the uh, 27 EU member states, but it depends on their contingencies, on their exposure to uncertainties, um, on patterns of interactions with non-EU countries and other geopolitical factors, uh, which explains, uh, which explain altogether, you know, why some EU member states may opt, may opt for non-standard agreements uh, or uh, not, anyway. The second part of my presentation deals with lessons learned. So what do we know about all that? Well, we know uh, many things, I would say. We know that cooperation on readmission is conducive to a kind of zero-sum game. What it means? It means that the costs and the benefits of the cooperation on readmission are extremely asymmetric. There's a winner, so to speak, and there's a loser. But all the time, well, you no longer know whether the loser is still a loser or the winner is still a winner. <laughs> I'm going to explain to you why. Just because cooperation on readmission is so much fraught with uncertainties, as I'm sure now you realize, that, um, well, you know, the cost and benefits need, and because of their asymmetry, you know, they, there's a great deal of imbalance, you know, they are unequal, you know, the cost and the benefits of a cooperation for obvious reasons, you know, uh, of course. Uh, they are so much unequal, but sometimes, you know, you need some compensatory measures in order to offset, you know, this asymmetry of costs and benefits, which is not easy. And very often, you know, uh, cooperation is, let's say, uncertain in so far as, you know, a, a non-EU country, a third country can claim more compensation or can decide, you know, in the end, to uh, renege, you know, the agreement to, you know, um, to, to quit the cooperation just because it has too many costs, be they financial, political, economic, uh, but also social, 
clearly. It's a very sensitive, politically, socially, financially, economically sensitive issue. Well, uh, commitments uh, in a bilateral agreements, be it uh, standard or non-standard, they are invariably unbalanced, okay? Uh, but there are other factors. Uh, readmission does not tackle irregular migration. It only facilitates, this is what has to be learned, it only facilitates the expulsion of irregular migrants and rejected asylum seekers. It is not aimed at dealing with irregular migration. But also, there's also a kind of, well, I would say a normative approach, which has been very often, at least at the beginning, you know, 20 years ago, but no longer now. There's very much, there was very much a normative approach to readmission, you know, saying, well, each state has, you know, the obligation under customary international law to accept, you know, the return of its own nationals. Oh, yes, uh, but I mean, this is not at all sufficient de facto to ensure, uh, but also explain the cooperation on readmission. All too often, bilateral agreements have been equated with domestic contracts, you know, that need to be respected and whose reciprocal commitments need to, to be complied with. But the reality is totally different. Because of the zero-sum game, which I've just explained to you, and the unequal costs and benefits, it's extremely difficult, you know, to maintain over the long term a full implementation of the commitments uh, stipulated in a bilateral uh, agreement. Okay. Incentives. Are they enough? They can be material or immaterial. M material means, you know, financial. Immaterial, it refers to, you know, uh, when a country needs to be recognized, needs to build alliances. This is part and parcel of international relations. Uh, so, a third country is seeking recognition. This is the case, just an example of Kosovo, which is knocking at the door of the EU member states in order to be recognized, you know, uh, as um, a legitimate uh, international actor uh, in the European, uh, in Europe and also elsewhere. Uh, well, readmission, cooperation of on readmission is also conducive to a kind of international recognition. Now, uh, this is important. Uh, there are incentives, uh, I, I agree, which are aimed at ensuring cooperation in the short to long term. But again, because of the, the unequal costs and benefits, very often such incentives are not even enough to ensure the regular cooperation on readmission. Uh, conditionalities, in other words, a kind of coercive attitude, you know, uh, this is actually the attitude of the EU with regards to non-EU countries, you know, we will, uh, we will exert our own leverage as, uh, as the EU, we have conditionalities, etc. But conditionalities also have their own limits. And, well, it can be a mantra uh, for the EU. But de facto, and again, in practice, this is extremely difficult. So maybe some of you will say to me, well, there was recently a conditionality which has been um, legally uh, enshrined in, uh, in a regulation, you know, the recast of a visa code in June um, 2019. Uh, there's the famous uh, Article 25A, which has been inserted in the reform of the Visa Code, and which is aimed actually as, at, um, at creating a conditionality between the delivery of, um, of the Schengen visas and effective cooperation on the readmission. In other words, if a third country is not cooperative enough on readmission, then you know we today have 
the instruments in order to exert a leverage on visa policies. Okay, but if you look carefully at Article 25A of the recast of the visa code, you will realize that yes, there's a conditionality, I agree. But there are criteria which are mentioned, clearly mentioned in Article 25A and which refer, you know, to the need, I quote, to take into consideration the overall relations with a given third country, the overall relations. This is totally undefined in uh, the recast of the visa code. Overall relations is, is also an expression which is recurrently used in the new pact on um, asylum and migration, uh, September uh, 2020. Um, it is again, as I said to you, not defined, but it shows that, well, it's not enough to refer to quantitative data, namely the number of, you know, laissez passes of the, 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 the a quantitative um, assessment of a cooperation on readmission. No, you have also non quantitative data that must be taken into consideration. In other words, the overall relations. Why? Just because among the numerous lessons that we have learned over the last 20 years, well, we know today that some third countries are today <clears throat> critical players in um, uh, in the field of readmission, you know, and uh, they are also critical players with regard to the co cooperation on border controls, on other strategic issue areas such as, um, you know, energy security, uh, intelligence, uh, the fight against international terrorism, and many of them have have managed to capitalize on their on these critical issue areas. So it's extremely difficult to exert a coercive, I would say, leverage, a, condi a conditionality on these non-EU countries. The overall relations need to be taken into consideration. Uh, do you follow me? I don't see you. Yes, yes, oh, we follow wonderful. you. Okay. So I will maintain my my. Oh, it would be one. nice because I, yes. I have like a blackboard, you know. Exactly, and, and I feel alone. So yes, Thank I you. invite whoever no, wants no, no, to enough. also turn I don't on want to the force video. People, I understand it. <laughs> the last point, which is also important, and we tend to forget that, this is a we are in Europe, but Europe, Europe has a supra has a supranational, but also an intergovernmental competence in the field of readmission. You will say to me, what? Yes, since the entry into force of the Treaty of Amsterdam in 1999, well, we have a hybrid system where intergovernmentalism cohabits, but at times collides with supranationalism. Why? Because since the Treaty of Amsterdam, you know, the EU is empowered to negotiate and conclude EU readmission agreements. I cannot get into these details. This is not the point of my presentation today, but we can have a, a conversation at, afterwards anyway. And I, what I was about to say to you is that, um, well, the member states sometimes do not have, do not share the same vision, the same priority, the same contingencies as applied to the co to cooperation on readmission, which is problematic for the EU, because the EU is trying to build its own common uh, European readmission policy. But well, we have we are twenty seven, and we don't share the same priorities. Why? Because readmission is part and parcel of a broader system of interactions, including other critical issues, issue areas, as I explained to you before. So uh, what is important in the bilateral cooperation between um, 
Spain and Morocco will perhaps not be that important for, for example, Lithuania and Morocco. And so these countries won't have the same vision for obvious geopolitical reasons, of course, and the EU has to deal with all these discrepancies. Anyway, the EU tends to have a very technical, legal approach to readmission. It always speaks about conditionalities, leverage, etc. But well, if you look at the practice of the EU member states, no, they don't speak about conditionalities. They speak about incentives, compensation, um, international cooperation, uh, international relations, strategy, and this is what they are talking about. This is a different repertoire for the EU, and this is quite important. All right. So I think I have already uh, explained to you, you know, why cooperation on readmission is fraught with uh, uncertainties. And also, that's why inform informalization is gaining momentum, because there are so many uncertainties that the member states, you know, try to opt for flexible patterns of cooperation on readmission, okay? And uh, just because it's a, they, they want, they argue that it's easy, easier, you know, to negotiate, etc. Is it more effective in terms of, if I may, number of people readmitted? No, not at all. Flexible or informal or non-standard patterns of cooperation on readmission, well, are not necessarily conducive to higher numbers of readmitted person, not at all. The big problem with the drive for informalization in the cooperation on readmission is that, well, there's no parliamentary oversi uh, oversight, actually parliaments are totally bypassed, which is problematic from a democratic point of view, but also when it comes to uh, uh, ensuring that each state is compliant with its own obligations, with its own uh, uh, commitments as applied to migrants, uh, human rights and protection against uh, violence and um, ill treatment. Anyway, this is extremely problematic from that uh, point of view. Uh, let's talk very quickly about the peripheral centrality paradox. What it means, I think it's a useful concept to again explain this paradox. You know, well, everybody's talking about uh, readmission, we have to cooperate. There's indeed a network, there's a cobweb of bilateral agreements which is expanding. I've just, I've just shown it to you. But also, what do uh, stakeholders, policymakers, practitioners know is that, well, in practice, well, it's quite, readmission is very much peripheral compared with all the issues of high politics, energy security, uh, the fight against international terrorism um, and over geopolitical issues anyway. So, you know, this paradox explains why there's so much rhetoric on readmission, but de facto, you know, um, well, cooperation is extremely uncertain anyway. I told you that I would like now to speak about the three functions. Of course, there's, as I've just shown to you, this peripheral centrality paradox. But well, readmission is bound up with three functions. And some of them are very much known, are, I would say even obvious, but all others are far less known, okay? But if we are to comprehensively address the reasons for which cooperation on readmission has become so pervasive in current uh, bilateral talks on migration, we must, I believe, explore the conditions that have been, that have contributed to making cooperation on readmission a key priority. So yes, the system that I'm talking about, it is coercive. It is coercive because well, readmission results from a prescriptive 
administrative order forcing a person to act in a specific way, to leave a national territory. Well, it leads to sanction, but might have, but might have severe implications for the rights and safety uh, of foreign nationals, and above all, when they are physically deported to conflict-ridden countries or to countries where irregular migration is punished by law. So yes, a readmitted person may be uh, expelled, exposed, uh, sorry, to human rights violation, to ill treatment and to violence. And this is a big problem when it comes to coercion, clearly. But well, there's also a, another uh, function, which is the, the function, well, the regulatory function. What is it? Because cooperation on readmission is one of the various mechanisms geared towards con uh, controlling the mobility of people, readmission has been cast as the means to combat ir illegal, irregular migration and to ensure the removal of rejected asylum seekers and unauthorized migrants. But it has also been presented as the technical instrument for deterring regular labor migrants from overstaying their temporary job contract. And this is the regulatory, the regulatory function, which has gained momentum over the last 20 years, I would, I would say. Um, at a bilateral level, countries like France, uh, Spain, and Italy have made the implementation of labor migration recruitment schemes conditional upon non-EU countries' reinforced cooperation on readmission with a view to ensuring the short-term recruitment of foreign labor in the domestic labor markets. Also, this, um, let's say, this linkage is enshrined in Spain uh, Plan Africa, but also in Italy's bilateral patterns of cooperation with many uh, Mediterra Mediterranean countries. But actually, it has been also enshrined and considered in the global approach to migration, which has been, which introduced mobility partnerships. I'm sure that all of you, I mean, if you work on migration issues, well, you all heard about mobility partnerships. Uh, you know that they are conditionally linked with cooperation on readmission. Actually, they are aimed at ensuring that regular labor migrants will not overstay the duration of their labor uh, contract. So these um, conditions, let's say, have had serious implications, you know, for the extent to which migrant workers' rights and aspirations are uh, respected, but also in terms of the gradual acceptance of temporariness as the paradig paradigmatic reference point for labor uh, policies. And this point leads me actually to the legitimizing function of readmission, namely its ability, its ability to feed into the gradual acceptance of temporariness as, again, the paradigmatic reference point for labor policies. Um, so let me spend some words, you know, on the legitimizing function, because I think it's quite interesting. Today, temporariness and job uncertainty are the common denominators of a modern working ex experience for, for a large proportion of workers, both native and immigrant, and across all sectors of industries. But I mean, how significant are these common denominators to our reflection on the uh, readmission uh, system? Well, to answer this tricky question, we must look at the re regulatory but also the legitimizing functions of the readmission system, and certainly more than at its coercive function. 
As I already explained before, bilateral cooperation on the readmission of, of foreigners has gained momentum in Western Europe alongside the implementation of temporary labor migration program. Today, cooperation on readmission between EU and non-EU countries is presented as a precondition for, implemented, for implementing these uh, labor migration programs. And I would say what makes current labor migration programs different from those that were implemented, let's say, until the 1970s, 1980s, lies precisely in what could be referred to as a process of time contraction, leading inevitably to a, to a certain con containment of rights and of career development. And this process of time contraction did not happen overnight. It springs from a learning curve whereby decision makers set out to tackle the reasons for which past temporary labor migration schemes had resulted in the prolonged, if not permanent, stay of migrant workers and their families in most European destination countries. So you understand that time is crucial to contain the rights of regular labor migrants with regard not only to labor rights per se, but also to access to housing, access to education, access to training, and last but, but not least, access to family reunification. You have strict criteria which must be met in order to access the right for family uh, reunification. So there's a clear contraction of the rights of labor uh, migrants. I will, I don't want to go, I, how much time is left, please? You may, uh, um, you still have some minutes. Uh, so, yes, uh, maybe more, more 10 minutes. Oh, boy, it's, I'm, I'm yes. almost done. Thank you. What I'm trying to say by focusing on the legitimizing function, when I'm saying that all that, all that is taking place um, in a context marked by the deregulation of labor market policy, the uh, retreatment of the state from the economy, offshoring, subcontracting, the um, localization also having implications not only for labor migrants' rights, but also for native workers' rights. And there's, I would say, a, a kind of paradox, you know, another one, sorry, <laughs> with regard to the reinforced regulation of international migration through, among others, readmission, and I've, and I've just shown to you the expansion of this system, which is illustrative of the need to regulate international migration. And this process, I would say, of reinforced regulation of international migration policies has gone hand in hand with the gradual deregulation of labor market policies. So um, you will say to me, what a strange paradox, but actually this is not paradoxical. If we consider that reinforced migration controls represented, but still represent today, actually, the most explicit way of mystifying the centrality of the state, when, as I said before, we observe a retreatment of the state from the economy, you know? So I would say this seems to be a troubling continuum, you know, between the temporariness of labor migrants, labor migration, sorry, and the temporariness of labor to cure. Now, we realize that what makes current 
current temporary labor migration schemes radically, radically different from the past equivalents lies not only in time contraction, but also in the more general legitimizing effects on a broader segment of society. And these forms of policy discretion not only impact on migrant workers' opportunity for advancement, labor rights, socialization in destination countries, they also convey a more general, though subtle, uh, message addressed to a growing cohort of short-term employees, part-timers, interns, trainees, uh, in other words, the European uh, precariat, but, but Guy standed, st standing comprehensively analyzed is in, in his book, but also, well, Saskia Sassen, uh, Richard Sennett, uh, Madeleine Schwartz, and many other uh, sociologists and, and labor, um, uh, labor migration specialists. So I think this is important, you know, to uh, observe that, well, we cannot refer to readmission with reference to coercion. Of course, it's important. But well, readmission has also a regulatory function and also a legitimizing function, you know. Um, it also contributes, you know, to making the drive for temporariness a mainstay of contemporary labor mar market policies. And well, I would say that this is very important. Well, mm, what I try to what I've tried to show to conclude is that well we cannot separate the condition you know of migrants labor migrants I would say on the one hand from the conditions of citizens and uh, native workers uh, these are two groups that policymakers have tried to divide or to distinguish you know if not to oppose. Uh, to uh, one, uh, one another. But actually, what I'm trying to say is that, well, if we look at the legitimizing and regu regulatory functions of the readmission system, if we try to go through the looking glass of the expanding readmission system, we will realize that the sword of Damocles uh, is not equally threatening for both foreign and native workers, but however, the hand that makes it dangle over their heads may be the same. And the key issue at stake is to reflect on the conditions under which the driver for temporariness um, cuts across the working conditions of both native and migrant workers and on how the latter's working conditions may permeate through the former's working condition. So again, and, and now these are my last, uh, my, this is my last reflection. Don't you think that the recognition of this linkage uh, constitute, constitutes the key precondition for questioning in a sincere and credible manner the lingering acceptance and worrying banality of readmission as it currently stands, is this uncomfortable uh, awareness not the most daunting challenge to be faced with when it comes to recognizing the, override, the overarching neoliberal paradigm that sustains this system and instills, and instills in the minds of voters the illusion that the containment of foreign workers' rights will protect them from the containment of their own social and economic rights. And I would like to leave you with this question. And I say thank you for your attention. Thank you.